This is your last video lecture for Unit 1, Intro to Geography. Today we're going to get through 1.4, 1.5, 1.6, and 1.7, and that'll be it for Unit 1. All done. Here we go. Section 1.4 is titled Spatial Concepts. What are the relationships among different places? So we're thinking across space here. Section 1.5 is called Human Environmental Interaction. How do humans adapt to and use the environment? And we're actually going to come back to that one at the end. We're going to go a little bit out of order because that's probably the most important section we're going to look at in this lecture. Uh, scales of Analysis is Section 1.6. The question is, why does the zoom matter? So when you're in a map zooming in or out, why does that matter and what does it change? And how does it affect uh, what we see in that map and what it's communicating to us? And finally, section 1.7, regional analysis. How are different places related or distinct from one another? So section 1.4, what makes a place unique? A place, the term place actually has a distinct definition in human geography. It's a specific point distinguished by a particular characteristic. So it has to be set apart in some way, right? It's a specific point, very specific point on a map, distinguished by a particular characteristic. So describing the features of a given place, it allows us to actually explain the similarities, differences, changes that we see across the earth from one place to another. So, so by using those particular characteristics, uh, we, we explain why that place is unique and we can actually use it relative to other places in looking at, say, um, environment, climate, politics, any of those things. So locations can actually be identified in three ways. Uh, one is through a place name. Okay, a place name, it, like Crown Point, for example, or anything, uh, is what's called a toponym. Toponym is the, speci uh, the actual technical term for place name. And toponyms come from all sorts of different origins. And you can see in this map over here, which is very, very zoomed in, uh, this is what we call large scale. We're, we're very zoomed in on this particular map. Um, it's the east side of Lake Michigan. If you're already thinking that, then you are correct. This is in Michigan, and it's the eastern coast of Lake Michigan. So uh, Kalamazoo is where uh, Western Michigan University is. Muskegon, you can see up here. And, and what's interesting about toponyms is they actually tell a story. They give us a little bit of insight into the past, the, uh, the, the history of this particular area. And, and what uh, something like Muskegon would tell us is that uh, there were Native Americans here, right? And um, we, we can see these, these names that represent the, um, uh, the Ottawa, Potawatomi tribes that uh, uh, hunted this area and lived in this area for a long, long time before uh, European settlers came into the area. If you were to go to somewhere like Southern California and see places like San Diego, Right? That is a representation of Spanish uh, explorers and conquistadors who moved into the area and named areas, uh, named places after the uh, religion that they practiced, which was Christianity. So San Diego, San, S-A-N, means saint in Spanish. So we can, it, we can see some of the history of these areas um, from the, the toponyms in those places. So a particular site has physical characteristics. If we're talking about Lake Michigan, for example, that would be uh, using site, using physical, char physical characteristics to explain or identify that location. When I was in uh, Canada for a long time, I had to tell people where I was from, and I couldn't say Crown Point because nobody even knows what Crown Point is. Um, even Indiana was kind of distant to them. So what I would say was, I'm on the very southern tip of Lake Michigan. And that they understood because Lake Michigan is, is a more recognizable feature or physical characteristic. Uh, I might also say that that is kind of like explaining situation, right? Um, I'm using the situation of Crown Point, the location relative to other places to, to tell people where I live. So 
if I said just south of Lake Michigan, that's one way to say it. That's kind of a physical characteristic. I could also say um, I'm very close to Chicago. I would I would tell people, hey, I'm yeah, I'm kind of 30 minutes outside of Chicago. That's a situation use of describing location. Okay, when I was trying to explain the location of Crown Point, I was using site and situation, mostly situation. So. We also get into spatial thinking and diffusion in this course quite a bit. Diffusion is a term that from here on out, now that you know it, uh, now that we've said it, you're going to hear it quite a bit. And you're going to hear your teachers use that term quite a bit. It is a core element of uh, human geography. And here's why. The farther away you are from someone, the less likely you are to interact. This is what we call distance decay. The more distance you have from somebody, the less likely you are to diffuse ideas to them. Okay, and what we mean by that is spread. Another word for diffuse is spread. So when I was talking about the Spanish conquistadors who um, battled their way into California and uh, took over some of those areas through, through sometimes some pretty heinous acts, they also brought with them some things like religion, language. That's diffusion. The reason Catholicism and Christianity in general are so popular in South America and Southwest United States, places like, uh, say, Southern California today, is because of diffusion. The Spanish brought their religion and their language with them to places that they conquered or explored and with that, diffusion occurred. Now, technology has kind of eliminated the distance decay issue in a lot of ways. Because we have a lot of smartphones around the world and computers and, and ways to communicate, distance decay has become less important. Um, we're still able to diffuse things to one another, even though we might be half a world away. A great example of that is K-pop, right? music from uh, South Korea that has become so popular uh, in the United States and really music from Asia in general, Southeast Asia and East Asia in general, uh, that has become so popular in the United States. With distance decay, that wouldn't be as possible, but technology has eliminated a lot of that. So there's three main types of diffusion. One is called relocation, one is called expansion, and one is called stimulus. Relocation diffusion is just physical movement. That's uh, typically the case with religion, like we talked about with the Spanish, right? Uh, that was relocation diffusion. Expansion diffusion is when it spreads from one place to another in kind of an additive fashion. So hierarchical, it starts with one top figure, uh, say uh, a religious leader, a political leader, um, some, some other type of national leader, cultural leader, whatever, and it goes top down from there. And then people put their own spin on it, things like that. Or it could be what we call contagious diffusion, which is still a type of expansion diffusion. And then we have stimulus diffusion. Stimulus diffusion, there's a spread of an underlying thing, but maybe not the rest of those details. It's, it's one particular stimulus that kind of sent uh, uh, shocking uh, throughout the, the population and they may not take on all the attributes of wherever that uh, particular um, uh, principle started, but there's something that has caught the eye of a lot of people, and, and this underlying principle is spreading quickly, even if it's changing in a lot of ways as it moves from one person to another. Now, scales of analysis are really important to look at. This is what we were talking about with Zoom. Okay, now um, it's, it's a, a pretty simple case here, a pretty simple takeaway, but very important. Okay, there's two things about scale. One is how we, we actually measure scale. Scale is expressed in one of three ways typically. Okay, and what do we mean by scale? Well, scale means how big or small is that map? And we don't mean the physical size, like a three foot map versus a one foot map. We're talking about how much is on the map. So if you had a map that was 12 by 12 inches, if it was a map of the world, that'd be very different than if it was a map of Indiana. Because if it's just a map of Indiana, we're going to be able to see a lot more detail than if it was a map of the world. Because they're both 
the same size map, 12 by 12 inches. There's three ways you can express the scale of a particular map. One is through a ratio or, or a fraction where we would say, okay, one is to 25,000. Now what that's telling you is the size of something on the map compared to what it really is in real life. Okay, we could also write it. You may have seen this before where it'll say like one inch is equal to one mile. So as you're looking at a map and you see 10 inches, you know that's actually 10 miles. Or it could be a graph, um, a graphic of some type, like the bar you see here. This is showing you how much a kilometer is. So you could technically use a, 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 some type of um, ruler or other measuring tool. And, and if you uh, had the map, you could see how many kilometers it was just by measuring that. So scale can be measured in a lot of different ways, but how is it used? Now. Take a look at this uh, moving animated map here for a second. We're starting more zoomed out and the map is zooming in, right? We're starting outside of Los Angeles and it's zooming in to a very particular point in Los Angeles, down to the street. We can actually see the street name there. What's happening in this map is that we're starting from a small scale and we're moving to a larger scale. So this scale is getting larger and larger as we zoom in. So sometimes people get that confused, but here's the way you want to think about it. Okay, when we start way out here, there's not much detail, but when we zoom in, we can see a couple things. There's a business here. I think it says Farmer Boys. Okay, Farmer Boys, that business is becoming larger. As we're getting closer and closer to it, it's getting bigger and bigger. It'd be like if you uh, jumped out of an airplane, you're skydiving, and you're floating down over uh, you know, some lake, right? Well, that lake is going to look really small at first, but as you get closer and closer, it's going to look bigger and bigger and bigger because the scale is becoming larger as you get closer to the ground. Now, zooming in and out, we actually do this all the time, but we don't think about it as changing our scales of analysis, we just think of it as zooming in and out. On Google, we use it for restaurants, gas stations, airports. On Airbnb, we use it to find lodging or, or tours and things like that. Uh, something like Uber, we might zoom in to find a ride in a particular location. So we use scales of analysis constantly in our day-to-day -day lives. We just don't always think about it like that. We're just zooming. Now, why does it matter? As scales of analysis change on a map, you get a lot more or less detail, right? The population is changing. The concentration of that population is changing. Uh, the options you get with businesses and, and services are changing. The diversity of a particular population might be changing in some way. So there's all kinds of things that scales of analysis can affect. Regional analysis is not about scale but what particular place we're actually located in and how those places compare to one another. So there's a great scene in the office when Andy is doing different, um, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, accents, thank you. And uh, sorry about that. He's doing different accents from different parts of the Southeast. And, and he kind of makes fun of Pam because they say that she sounds like she's from Alabama when they're trying to do a Florida accent. And what's funny is you can see on this map, here's Alabama, here's Florida. They're very close, right? But just being, say, in this part of Alabama versus in this part of Florida can be very, very monumental when it comes to the accent that people in those particular areas put off when they speak. Okay, so accents tell us a lot, but regional analysis doesn't just stop there. We tend to group people who live in the same area by certain patterns of activity or other characteristics as well. A region gets its unified character through what we call a cultural landscape. Cultural landscape is an extremely important term. It's one that comes up a lot on the AP exam, actually, and one that students, quite honestly, have a difficult time wrapping their minds around. And if you think about landscape, just think about uh, the, the land itself. If you were to look out, step outside your door and look upon the land, 
you could see different elements of culture. Okay, whether that was a church or a gas station or a school or a mosque or a synagogue or a sign that was written in Spanish versus English versus French, you can start to get a lot of information about where you are in the world. Okay, let's say you see a, a speed limit sign and it's written in kilometers per hour instead of miles per hour. That's going to tell you something right away. So a region with all of these elements, cultural, religious, and physical features, can give us an idea of the cultural landscape of that particular region. Okay, now in the United States, you might see even elements of language. Up in the Northeast, there are a lot of French speakers. You might see more things written in French next to English than you would in, say, the West. In the West, you might see a lot of things written in Spanish to accompany English. So depending on where you go, even in the United States, there are all different types of cultural landscapes. And there's different types of regions, too. There's what we call a formal region, a functional region, or a vernacular region. A formal region is very uniform. It's very what we call homogenous, which is similar, okay? Um, they share a lot of different characteristics. Maybe it's language, maybe it's climate, maybe it's religion. Sometimes these become what we call nation states where uh, everyone in that population is pretty darn similar. There's also what's called a functional region or a nodal region. A functional region is kind of centered around a focal point. That could be um, a physical characteristic, it could be a religious characteristic, but it's focused around a specific node or a uh, focal point. A vernacular region, which is sometimes called a perceptual region, is uh, some type of cultural identity. There's a shared history in that particular region. Uh, Chinatown is a good example. Even in the middle of a city like Chicago, you have uh, Chinatown because they have this shared history or cultural history and cultural identity. All right, very last. I told you that uh, human environmental interaction was going to be the last section, and it's because, quite honestly, it's the most important. Um, how do humans adapt to and use the environment? Well, Unfortunately, we've used it in quite a lot of uh, destructive ways, and currently we're trying to work against some of those damages that we've done to the uh, environment, and um, that's through what we call sustainability. So human action and sustainability. Sustainability is the maintenance of the earth to preserve this ecological balance, and human action uh, is one of the most important factors there. Definitely the earth goes through phases, but human action, especially as the population continues to climb across the globe, has such a major influence on the resources available. So there's two major misuses of resources. One is the depletion of non-renewable resources, okay, at, at way too quickly of a rate. Two is destroying renewable resources through pollution. Now, a lot of these re non-renewable resources, you have to understand, they have helped us to develop uh, the strongest economy in the world, right? The strongest industrial economy in the world. But we know that these non-renewable resources will run out at some point. They will. And we're going to have to lean on these renewable resources. But unfortunately, we are polluting. And we're polluting by the use, through the use of these non-renewable resources, like the burning of coal or, or things like that. So it's kind of a vicious cycle, but let's take a look at what's being done about it. There's three pillars of sustainability. One is what we call the environment pillar. Sustainability only works if humans embrace conservation, if humans actually embrace this idea of the environment being important. Two is the economy pillar. The prices of goods should be set according to environmental cost in addition to supply and demand. So in the United States, we only use supply and demand. That's what's called the free market. That's capitalism, and it's, it's been very successful. What this is arguing is that if a car is particularly fuel inefficient, it's really bad for the environment, the price of that car should be really, really high, even if it doesn't go according to, uh, doesn't go with the laws of supply and demand. Even if that car is in low demand, and there's a high supply of it, 
the price should still be really high because it has a high environmental cost. Now, as Americans, uh, you, you'd probably be less likely to find people who are in favor of that um, compared to, say, Western Europe. But uh, this is one of the pillars of sustainability. The third pillar is, is the society pillar. It says wants and needs, things like shelter, food, and clothing, can be redirected to more sustainable options. So one example is shelter. Uh, you know, there are some people who have multiple homes because they've, they've worked hard, they've been very successful, and they can afford it. But what this would argue is that maybe those homes aren't necessary if nobody's staying in them for a long period of the year. Like if you're only in it for one week out of the year and it just sits there while there's people who are homeless, then maybe that's not the best uh, uh, situation. Or, or in, uh, in more of a sustainability aspect, if somebody were to plow over land that could have been preserved to build a home that they really don't need, well, maybe that's not such a sustainable option. So this isn't to throw anyone under the bus or, or guilt anyone for that. These are just the three pillars of sustainability, and this is what they argue. Now, the Earth is made up of these physical systems, right? And we have to understand these systems, these four different types of natural resources, before we can start talking about how we uh, alter the use of these resources. So there's abiotic systems and then there's biotic systems. The abiotic systems are abiotic, non-living, inorganic. One is atmosphere, two is hydrosphere, three is lithosphere. Atmosphere is gas, hydrosphere, water, Lithosphere is the physical Earth, the, the Earth's cr crust and then the layer just below it. So the biotic system is everything else. Everything that's living, all the living organisms on Earth, that is the biosphere. So there's these four types of natural resources. Once again, there's three abiotic, atmosphere, hydrosphere, lithosphere, and there's one biotic system. That's the biosphere, and that's everything that's living on the Earth. So last but not least, very last slide I wanted to look at for this lecture is unsustainable human action. And what we're going to do is connect some of the issues, some of the, the uh, behaviors that we've been seeing with sustainability or lack of sustainability to some of the consequences that we might experience in society because of those actions. So one example would be Air pollution causes trouble breathing. So air pollution, which is caused from um, overactivity in, in uh, industrial areas to the burning of fossil fuels to um, too many cars on the road, whatever it might be, air pollution causes trouble breathing, respiratory issues in people. And that's going to increase healthcare costs which is then going to push money away from education, push money away from, uh, say, uh, 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 defense or other government services that are going to have to take the hit because people are having more health issues because the air is dirty. So that's one example of how we can look at unsustainable action leading to some type of uh, social cost. Unsafe water. This is a major issue in places like uh, India, for example, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, other parts of uh, South Asia, not, not just India, but also in the United States. And, and this leads to all kinds of other health issues. And, and in some cases, um, the repairing of infrastructure, which is going to cost all kinds of money and, again, take resources away from other places that might need it. Resource shortages. If we use an over uh, uh, abundance of non-renewable resources and start running out of some of these things that we need quite dearly, that's gonna lead to higher prices, which is gonna lead to higher price tags for us, the customers, and we're gonna have less money to spend on everything else. So, so there's an economic consequence of unsustainable action. Too much erosion in the ground is going to cause agriculture issues. So, for example, um, going back to India, in India there's a huge issue with the overgrazing of cattle in some areas, and it causes erosion and desertification in the ground. It, it becomes uh, um, uh, to the point where you can't grow anything there, and so agriculture is depleted. 
well, if agriculture continues to be depleted, and these areas are going through major droughts, for example, and desertified in, in this way or that, we're going to have less food to go around. Prices are going to go up. There's all kinds of issues that might stem from that. Now, fortunately, we can make modifications, right? Um, we can right the ship, so to speak. We can still fix these things, whether it's through individual action or collective action on a national scale, on a regional scale. These things can still be fixed, but human behavior is certainly going to have to change. And, and unfortunately, uh, just recently, just last year, we saw a horrible example of uh, what can occur from human action down in the Amazon and, and in all of South America. So in the Amazon rainforest in Brazil, people were using slash and burn agriculture, which is normally fine. But unfortunately, they were burning before they were slashing and fires started to take off and, and uh, uh, spread all throughout the Amazon. And, and all of this area was destroyed. Uh, the ecological balance in that area thrown out of whack for who knows how many years to come. And it was all a result of human action and it could have been avoided. And that's one example of how human environmental interaction can go bad. But in a lot of ways, we've seen it... Uh, um, go well in the past uh, too, but unfortunately we've seen a lot of bad examples as of late and some of the consequences of those examples. So that's it for today and actually that's it for unit one everyone. Good job, unit one, all done in the books. So this is just a reminder to um, make sure you go back and finish up and submit any assignments that were expected from you in unit one so you can get all those points taken care of before moving into the test okay if you are preparing for the unit one test make sure you use the practice test that we've made available to you as well as the study guide and go back and look through all these google slide notes that we have watch the videos and as always reach out to myself or your teacher or any of the three of us for any questions that you might have all right thanks see you for unit two